Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV, and we are continuing our Eastern Front set of shows, two weeks of shows. I realise there's a couple that didn't happen, but they will happen at some point in the future. That is the one with Ian McGregor, and the other one about Lend Lease will be coming your way at some point. But today, my guest hails from Idaho, where she has led various local history projects. But today, she's going to talk about uh, women in the Red Army. My guest is Haley Noble, so I'm going to bring her in now. So, good afternoon, Haley. How are you today? Hello, I'm great. How are you? I'm very well. So, I mean, we were just chatting before going online there, uh, and I, I, I like to introduce new guests. Uh, you know, you're quite a, you're well known in the area you taught, you 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 do your history in, but for my audience, you're you're a newbie. Um, yeah. And Idaho, you know, your your World War Two is just one of the aspects you talk about pioneer history. So, tell us a little about yourself and the projects you're involved with before we start bringing up the Women in the Red Army. Sure. Um, I went to school here in Idaho. Um, and so, of course, you know, this is where I also work. So a lot of our history that we talk about is local. Um, but while I was in Boise, I did a lot of uh, criminology history as well because I worked at the Idaho Territorial Prison, uh, the old Idaho Penitentiary. Now it's a historic site. Um, and then I got this job here at the Lata County Historical Society where uh, we run a historic house museum called the McConnell Mansion. Um, and then we do a lot of just local programs on local histories. Um, I'm really excited this spring we're doing a queer history project looking at the LGBTQ community here. Um, so a lot of local stuff that I know, um, unless you've been to Idaho, most people don't know where it is. Um, but I'm really excited to be here and talk about these awesome women. Well, I have to say, when I do, there's a little online quiz that I play every now and then when I'm bored where you have to identify the 50 states. And I tend to always get Idaho. It's one of the ones I do get. There's lots That's of great. Like, really confused, but Idaho, I'm quite, I get a bit stuck around the ones about the Great Lakes sometimes. But, you know, I, I'm fairly good for a European. But anyway, the fact, yeah. getting to the subject of women in the Red Army, we've tackled it a few times already on World War II. TV. Indeed, we talked about it earlier this week with the snipers. And I'm sure you'll agree with what Luba said, is that, that there has been this fascination on the uh, quote-unquote sexier roles, the female snipers, the dark, the wolves hunting in the snow, and, and the kind of night witches and the aviation aspect. But for an army of its size, a lot of women were just doing not boring jobs, but not quite as exciting as those two, the, two things there. So, you know, um, how did your interest get into the Red Army? And, and you know, it's something you're very, very keen on talking about and learning about. But where did your interest in the Red Army come from? You know, I don't know if I could actually, like, pinpoint it. Um, I was doing my graduate work at Boise State University, and I knew I wanted to do World War II history. I knew I wanted to do public history. And so at one point, you know, I was trying to figure out what do I want to study? Originally, my thesis was going to be on combat art as ways to document battles and things like that. But I just started reading a bunch of these stories and I just felt like I was being pulled in that direction that I needed to do this. It just really held my attention. I felt that it was important. And so I ended up doing my public history uh, project. It was an exhibit on women in the red army and you know part of that was just to spread the word to get more people interested get the word out there uh, at the time during my public history studies um the american army was really questioning and really starting to open up um combat roles to women so i was able to frame my exhibit as a sort of argument in favor of American women being able to be in these combat roles. And I essentially used these Soviet women as examples to show that, you know, these arguments that military officials were making were simply invalid. So yeah. that's kind of how I framed things and was able to look at it and refute a lot of these uh, sexist, you know, untrue ideas that were being perpetuated well, that's a good response. And we just had a question. I know you want to talk about this. What exactly is public history? Lorelai is asking, because um, we talk about the various branches of popular history and academic history and public history. Of course, there's a big overlap between, but how would you define public history? Um, I would say public history is basically anything outside of academia. So I, you know, I'm not an academic. 
I'm a public historian. That means basically anything you can think of that brings history to the public. So podcasts, museums, doing different archival work. Um, you know, it really ranges in a whole bunch of different directions. Um, you know, a lot of people say, you know, maybe you are an academic and you write an opinion piece in the newspaper or something, you know, about a local decision or, you know, of course we've had a lot of um, issues here in the United States about the overturn of Roe v. Wade. And so mm -hmm. I know a lot of his women historians who have written, you know, pieces for public consumption. I consider that public history because it is intended not for other academics. That's a, a fantastic response, and that's exactly what it's all about, is explaining sometimes the past to people about the past, but using it as, an, as a way of looking at the present. But anyway, we're going down a rabbit hole of talking about public history, but you've come with a PowerPoint, which you'll be in charge of today. So we're talking about female Soviet soldiers in World War II. We will do questions as we go along, folks, uh, because we will. And But basically, I'm handing over to you, Heidi, to tell us more about this, uh, this subject. Sure. Um, so I know earlier in the week uh, you had... Uh, Dr. Vinogradova on talking about snipers, so I am not going to be talking about them. And we also know that there is quite a large population of women that were involved in aviation. And, you know, I, I felt like that was just too much to try to cram in here with everything else. So I'm sure you will do an aviator uh, show at some other time. <laughs> um, so instead, I chose to focus on um, machine gunners, medics, and tankers, uh, because, you know, they are perhaps a little bit lesser known. You know, they're not as famous as the Night Witches or, you know, these deadly snipers that got so much attention. Um, so it's, you know, just a little lesser known, but equally important. And I should just add it, it seems to me, as we'll find out, also much more integrated. You know, one of the mm -hmm. things we learned about, about the snipers of the night, which is there was this ability to kind of form their own units to some extent and keep themselves away from things. And as I'm sure we will touch on the aspect of the fact that there, there are women in the war zone, their sexuality, that rape came up as a subject and not that we're dwelling mm -hmm. on the nasty side of things, but machine gunners are maybe much more integrated as were tankers with a much more masculine environment. So all those problems are going to be, I'm guessing, increased as well. Yes, that is correct. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the aviators, you know, they had all female units. Same thing with the snipers, you know, they could be fairly uh, sectioned off. Of course, you know, our men are always a threat, no matter what. But here you do have definitely a more cohesive integration of women serving directly alongside men. And so, yes, uh, I mean, sexual assault is a reality. Um, we know that it happens. And the way that I think about it is, especially, I don't know how things are overseas, but here in the States, um, you know, they say, oh, rape, sexual assault, it happens, oh, that means we can't have women in these situations. And to me, that seems really like victim blaming that, you know, that's not addressing the problem. That's swiping it under the rug that, oh, if this happens, so we won't just let women in when it's like, no, this is a cultural problem. It's a cultural problem among men that needs to be addressed. So it did happen. And it's awful. And a lot of things that I read, of course, you know, sexual assault and rape, it's all about a power dynamic, that it's, it's all about control and power. And so from different accounts that I've seen, you know, a lot of times the sexual assaults were perpetuated by officers with lower ranking women, mm -hmm. you know, as a power move, essentially. Um, and it is, it's very unfortunate that these women had to essentially, you know, fight a war against an enemy, fight a war to protect themselves within the unit. And also, you know, as a woman, you have to prove yourself so much more than men do, because if you fail as a woman, that means you are representative of your whole sex that, well, you failed, so we're not going to let women in. 
And yeah, that, that yeah, yeah, that the extension of that. Uh, well, if you're if you're not very good, that means the whole of your gender must be really must be terrible. Let's just yeah. That whereas with if you had an individual ta male tanker who wasn't very good, you wouldn't dismiss the the male sex because one guy was bad. But that that idea. And folks, please don't think we're going to go down this becoming kind of like a male bashing show. It isn't that kind of thing. We just like to open up to to, to, to talk about the reality of these subjects. So it's uh, and when you're talking about women in World War II, unfortunately. Uh, sexual um, threats and violence is, is an integral part of it, and ignoring it is is wrong. Yes, yes, no male bashing here. Just uh, talking about the the experiences. Yeah. Um, anyway, right. back to you. We went down a rabbit hole again there, but yeah. Apologies, I love my tangents. Um, so uh, one of the things I love about the subject are just there are so many fascinating photos. You know, we've got here on the left. Um, a woman with a DP-27 light machine gun. We've got a Maxim machine gun. We've got a T-34 tank. Um, we've got a group of medics. It's just, you know, a fascinating look at some of these women. Uh, I figured we could profile just a few of them, um, you know, personalize some of it, uh, get some really unique perspectives, I think. So the first woman here is Nina Anilova. She started in the war as a medic. Um, she enlisted at age 20, and she was deployed in August 1941. Um, before the war, she had some training. You know, I think, um, if I recall, Liuba talked about the intense militarization of the Soviet society in the 1930s. Um, that was precisely what happened. She got some training with guns before the war. She enlisted as a medic. But, you know, when you get in these combat situations, sometimes you have to pick up a gun and defend yourself, even if you are just a medic. So she quickly proved herself capable um, with a PPSH-41 light machine gun. And let's see, she participated in the defense of Odessa and Sevastopol. And one of her harrowing accounts is that in November 1941, she crawled from her trench across 20 meters of open ground, and she was able to throw some Molotov cocktails setting a German tank on fire. Uh, for those actions, she you know, gained some acclaim for, uh, across the Soviet Union. Uh, then again, in February 1942, she destroyed two enemy machine gun nests and was able to, you know, put down suppressing fire for her unit's retreat. Um, while she was there alone, she took a mortar blast to the chest and she was wounded, took a couple days for her to pass. Um, which eventually happened on March 8th, 1942. And for those actions, she earned the Order of the Red Banner. And then in 1965, we see quite a bit of these uh, medals being awarded posthumously. Um, and so she was granted the Hero, Hero of the Soviet Union in 1965 for those actions. And so, um, unfortunately, many of the women I'm talking about today were killed in action. And, you know, we, it's tragic, but in a war that killed so many, it's inevitable that, you know, we're going to have high female casualties just as we did with men. So, moving on. Next is Manship Namatova. She was a machine gunner, and she was born in what is now Kazakhstan. Um, there were a few women who uh, served from that unit. And she originally was rejected from the army. She volunteered, but they, you know, they weren't to that point where they were desperate enough. You know, the war had just started. It was later on that they really were losing high numbers. And so eventually she was um, allowed into the army as a clerk. And so she was, you know, doing paperwork in the rear. And 
then she was sent to a field hospital to be a nurse. They needed nurses. You know, at this point, you send any able-bodied person who can do the job. You get training on the job. So she became a nurse. And as a nurse, she kept training because she wanted to be on the front lines. And so in her spare time, she would use the Maxim machine gun and kept practicing and eventually convinced a commander to uh, show him what she could do. And he said, all right, you can come join a rifle unit. That's great. <laughs> um, so she was on the front line and eventually the unit she was with was retreating. And again, we see these women who put down suppressing fire so their unit can retreat. And that's what happened. She refused, understanding that if she stopped firing, they would all die and be overrun. And so her unit was able to escape while she was uh, wounded. Uh, she was killed on October 15, 1943. And the people that came upon the battle, the remains, they believe that she killed more than 70 Germans as part of their advance. So it's pretty incredible that she was able to, you know, get her comrades to safety. Mm. Amazing uh, story. Mm -hmm. And... This next one, Yulia Drunina, she is uh, fascinating because she does survive the war, but she also becomes a poet after the war. Um, she writes and uses poetry to express herself in those days after the war. She you know, uses poetry to process, and we know that writing and doing, having these creative outlets can be very cathartic. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with PTSD. And Yulia is, um, her story is very interesting because she really kind of fell into combat. It wasn't, you know, she didn't go to an enlistment office. She, she was volunteering at a local hospital after the German invasion. And they needed people to help uh, fortify um, you know, the region outside Moscow, they needed volunteers to come and help with the heavy lifting. And so she did. She was outside Moscow and Moscow, sorry. I'm in Moscow, Idaho, and then there's Moscow, Russia. So apologies if I stumble. <laughs> well, there's no right or wrong. I say Moscow, uh, others say Moscow. It's the, the okay. British living in France, you're American. It's, it's, there's no definitive way of saying this, this <laughs> these, these places. Are, but some are more bound to point it out in a comment. I said it wrong or you said it wrong. We both said it wrong, but hey, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, uh, while she was out fortifying this region, um, there was an airstrike and she got separated from the rest of the group. And eventually she got picked up by an infantry unit. She had medical training and they needed a medic. So she stayed with them performing, you know, these medical procedures that they needed. And, you know, after the danger had passed, she returned to Moscow to be with her father. And they were evacuated to Siberia as um, civilians. They were evacuated. But her father died. And when he died, she joined a rifle unit and got sent to the Belarusian front. She was wounded in 1943 at that point, And that was when she started writing poetry in the hospital as she was convalescing, recovering. Um, she started writing poetry about the war. She was recovered, sent back to the front line and ultimately was wounded again. And after she was wounded, um, that was the end of her time in the army. And after that, she ended up attending a literature school and she survived up until um, 1991, where after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, she committed suicide, unfortunately. Um, these are just a couple of her poems that I particularly liked. Um, you know, and you can see in, in 1976, she still reflecting on her time in the army. So you can just see that it stays with you. I mean, everybody knows that, but it really helps 
process. Yeah, and the, and the uh, one on the left is present tense, one on the right is past tense. So she's mm -hmm. the first one she's writing it when it's when it's active and um it obviously when poetry has been translated it you're losing a little bit of, of nuance there. But it 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 it, you know, one of the questions that's obviously going to come up is is motivation for these women being because again, when we're talking with Dr. Lubia on 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 Tuesday, the the romantic idea from video games is they've always had a, a husband or a boyfriend that was killed in the early part of the war, and they're, they're going they're going to the army to to avenge that that loss of a loved one. But of course, the the, the reasons for enlisting or being conscripted were as, uh, as varied as they are for men. Yeah, you know, the. the so um, was there a common denominator in your research of why these women wanted to, because some of them, you said, actively wanted to be in a combat role. They sought to be in, in combat. Is there a particular reason you think that is universal or is it as many different reasons as I just said? I mean, many different reasons. I mean, there, there, there is, you know, why, why do men want to fight? It's the same thing. You're, you're defending your country from an invasion. Um, you know, maybe you don't know what to do so you say let's let's do this um let's get some training let's meet people let's travel um so it really varies there i certainly think revenge is an aspect for some people but not all um yeah there's no one reason no definitely and i think it's again it's the, we're talking about it it's the the the, the uh, attitudes we have about women in the red army and, and one of the questions came up is is what was the attitude of men towards them well we know at a higher level stalin had problems with there being women the other red army officers had their problems being there but and then at the bottom end the accounts i've read i'm sure yourself is that once these women had proven themselves they were they were generally completely accepted by their units and and and, and their gender sexuality kind of became less of a thing once they'd proven themselves but it, it, it is a complicated subject. It's always through the mirror of the lens with not only have we got a limited amount of writing by women, we've also got the whole propaganda aspect when you're dealing with the Red Army of what was said about people that was was or wasn't true. You know, the stories of some mm -hmm. of the snipers that Lugia was talking about, there were the propaganda office kind of invented backstories that weren't anywhere near the truth. So it, it's a complicated subject. Yeah, it really is. And it's, it's complicated because you do have an extremely patriarchal society that these women grew up in. Yeah. And yet you see these propaganda um, campaigns where it's basically shaming, you know, Germans to say, oh, look, you know, they believed Russians were so beneath them. And yet this mere woman was able to inflict this much damage. So it's, it's very complicated because on the one hand, it is very um, insulting to the Germans, and yet they don't always talk what they preach then back, you know, within the Soviet Union. So I, again, I don't have a straightforward answer. It's just very nuanced, and I don't know enough about it to further comment. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? We're, we're, we're the, the, to some way, the, in some ways, the ship has sailed now. Going, you know, we can't go back in time and interview these women. They, they, they're both, they're most, a lot have died in the war. A lot have died since the war. So now we're at an era where we are really fascinated by understanding these experiences. You can't go back in time and get the information that wasn't taken. I often, I'm going down another rabbit hole, which people love me saying rabbit hole because, of course, it's the code to have a drink. So people are already uh, <laughs> half drunk. I've said it three or four times today, but it. You know, we're fascinated by the British and Commonwealth 14th Army in Burma, but we have the white voices. We have the, the voices of the British Army officers, but we don't have many Sikh and, and, and Muslim voices and West African voices because they weren't collected then and we can't go back in time and collect them. So to some extent, when someone like yourself is studying uh, the, the Red Army 80 plus years on, you can't put accounts in place that were never taken. So everything that you're doing is always going to be through the lens of other people's experiences and other people's viewpoints. But um, anyway, you've put a slide up. I'll keep going. I'll keep interrupting you. I'm being very naughty. No, you're today. fine. No, and I will say, you know, I don't speak Russian, so I am very much at the mercy of what's been translated. Yeah. So it's the lens of, you know, being 80 years later, but it's also the lens of the translation. You know, things aren't always translated perfectly. And there's only so much that has been, you know, put into English. And so I'm sure we would find a whole other course of things in Russian. But I, you know, I'm not an academic. I didn't study Russian. So here we are. Um, anyway, anyway we, you've put a slide up. Uh, so let's talk about the medal. 
Yeah, yeah. So this is Maria Borovichenko. Uh, she was in medical school when the war broke out. And so she was able to offer herself as a medic. Um, during the advance on Kiev, she escaped. Uh, and while she did, she was able to gather valuable intel. And she passed that along to the 5th Airborne Brigade. Uh, with her intelligence, they were able to destroy some artillery. And, you know, this was just one instance where she proved herself useful. Um, and we see that a lot with women being excellent scouts and spies because they're, again, uh, they're more invisible, per se. Um, and so that was just one instance. She stayed with the 5th Airborne and became their medic and a scout. Uh, she also was able to handle weapons, so she was valuable to keep with them. Um, she, there are accounts of her firing her weapon as she is attending to the wounded. So it's pretty incredible. Um, this photo is not of her. I could not find a photo of her. So unfortunately, I don't know who the woman is in the picture. Um, but I think it just demonstrates, you know, and same with the quote that here, really just the pure exertion that they had to um, go through. Anyways, back to uh, Borovichenko. She was able to um, capture 10 Germans single-handedly in September of 41, um, and that earned her very high esteem in these um, units. And unfortunately, in 1943, in July, she was um, knocking out a tank with an anti-tank grenade, and there was ultimately shrapnel that she um, was shielding a wounded officer from, and that killed her as she was, you know, protecting her patient. Um, again, in 1965, she received the Hero of the Soviet Union Award for those actions where she saved this man's life. Uh, let's see what else. All right, moving on to tankers. So Maria Oksibrskaya, um, she joined the war effort. She was uh, 38. So most of these women that we talk about, they're you know, 17, 18, 20, very young. Um, she was 38, so a little bit different. And she is one of our revenge stories that we hear about. Um, after learning about the death of her husband in the war, she ultimately sold all of her possessions and bought a T-34 tank that she donated to the army. And, you know, her stipulations were that she wanted to drive it and she wanted to be in command of it. No, that's and, not really that thought. That's just fantastic, isn't it? Is buying your own tank and insisting yeah. you can drive it. That there's a lesson to us all, folks. You want to do something you, you you're not really supposed to do is bring your own tool to the job. There, you know. Yeah, you know, do it yourself. You know, if you want something done. I've got my own tank outside. That is just fantastic. Possibly the best story I've heard for a week or two. That is really brilliant. Yeah, I know. And um, one of the other stipulations is uh, the tank has to be called Fighting Girlfriend. Wow. So, you know, pretty amazing. She, you know, attended five months of training. She learned how to become a driver, a mechanic, and then she was sent to the front in September of 1943. Uh, and her first action, her tank was, you know, the first to breach enemy positions. She destroyed numerous machine gun nests and artillery emplacements. And, you know, she continued to distinguish herself in battle until unfortunately she was another one who was killed in action. Um, her last battle was January, 1944. She drove her tank into German territory, you know, knocking out fortifications, but her tank was hit by an anti-tank round and it disabled the track. So she was out repairing it. And unfortunately, uh, you know, there's heavy fire. She was hit by shrapnel before she could get back in the tank. Um, she was pretty badly wounded and ultimately died two months later. And uh, a few months after that, she was posthumously awarded Hero of the Soviet Union in August of 1944. 
Let's see. Another tanker is Alexandra Stamosenko. And a lot of what we know about her comes from the other gentleman there on the screen, Joseph Byerly. Uh, he was an American GI who was, um, he was with the 101st Airborne. And on D-Day, his C-47 came under heavy fire. And, you know, we know that they were scattered all across the countryside. Uh, these paratroopers as they jumped and he was captured and taken to a German POW camp. So he was there for about seven months. Uh, and meanwhile, he escaped in January 1945 and was picked up by Sammy uh tank brigade. He convinced her to let him stay to serve alongside her and her unit. Um, and so he was with the Red Army for about a month. Uh, he is believed to be the only person that served with the United States Army and the Red Army. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, and, you know, after Byerly's uh, time with Samusenko, he said that he grew to really respect her, that she was a symbol of fortitude and courage displayed by the Soviet people that, you know, she really made an impression on him. And eventually uh, this unit he was with, with the tanker, they freed his former POW camp. And he was one of the few who was awarded the Soviet Order of the Red Banner for liberating Warsaw. So it was pretty interesting, you know, things come full circle. Um, I'll, I'll go back to Alexandra. I just, yeah, I just want to add a little bit about Joe Barley, if you don't mind. Well done for getting his name correct as well, because his, his, both his sons were friend of my, friends of mine. John, oh, was, wonderful. John the second died a couple of years ago. And John, okay. the eldest son, became the American ambassador to Russia for, for several years in the, the oh. 2000s. And got into a little bit of trouble because when he would, well, not trouble as such, but when he was in Russia, this is John the son on his uh, diplomatic work, he would always talk about the fact his father encountered this female Soviet tank, you know, tank officer. And it would often get into problems because that wasn't the message he was meant to be saying about women being involved in important roles and things like that. But uh, very important. And so, so the Bailey family have still maintained this deep connection with Russia. Um, and when, because Joe died in 2005, uh, 2004. Like 2004. And for mm -hmm. about five years afterwards, there was a massive, great touring exhibition that went across uh, the Russia uh, of Joe Biley. And he, he became a really big, a good example to Russians of, of a good American and, and a, a fantastic story. So, yeah, that was a, I, I'm, I'm really pleased you brought that one in there because the, the Biley family were very important to me. His son also, the Joe, the Joe, the second son, served in Vietnam with the 101st as Air Mobile. So they had a big legacy, that family. But, um, yeah, it's... Uh, a great story. And um, allegedly, uh, Joe got his uh, award given to him by Zhukov uh, when he was in hospital. And whether or not that's actually true, because you know, he, he didn't know, he didn't understand Russian, but he was in hospital, wounded one serving with a tank. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm stealing your thunder. And an officer came in who decorated him. And later, when Bailey looked at photos, he thought it was Zhukov, but it might have been someone else, but if it was Zhukov who decorated it, it was fantastic. But anyway, I, I just thought I'd add that little personal story there because the Bayern no. family are very important to, to me. And um, and of course, the other thing is, is Joe had been reported dead in, in mm -hmm. Normandy because his dog tags had been found on a, on a German soldier. Long story there. And his family re received the $10,000 death pet benefit for Joe being dead. And he turned up at the end of the war. The family had to send the $10,000 back. And his mum said... <laughs> The only time I wrote a check for ten thousand dollars, I was really pleased to do because it meant my son was alive. But anyway, uh, yeah. all, of, all of Joe's stories told in the, the the book Behind Hitler's Lines, which is the the, the paperback version, or I think the original version. Uh, I forget what it's called now, but I've I've got four copies of it, including a Russian copy. But anyway, I digress. I'll let you get back to talking no. about Alexandra. No, that's great. I'm glad you interjected. Um, Anyways, Alexandra, she initially uh, became her, uh, started her military career. She was fighting in the Winter War in Finland, um, first before the German invasion. Um, and so she went to the tank academy um, as a tank commander. She operated the T-34, and it's believed that she was 
perhaps the only woman tanker in the first guards tank army. Um, in the Battle of Kursk, she was awarded Order of the Red Star for bravery. Um, and she, her actions speak for themselves, that she was a, you know, a wonderful commander. Um, she received all these awards. Um, it's believed that during the East Pomeranian Offensive, that was um, in March 1945, that that is where she ultimately perished. But um, I believe that this is up for debate. There's, you know, some people aren't really sure of the method of her death. Some say that Semisenko was crushed under ta under a tank um, that couldn't see her. Another is that she was crushed by a German artillery vehicle. One other version is that just her legs were crushed and the Germans captured her. Um, you know, with that story, it's believed she was interrogated, tortured, and shot. And then another account is that she died from a direct hit in a tank, managed to get out, and then passed away succumbing to her wounds. So, unfortunately, we don't really know exactly how she died, um, but the date is March 3rd, 1945, and you know, regardless of how she died, she was still a badass woman. Um, let's see, next step. And then, of course, um, another area that there were quite a few women uh, were manning anti-aircraft emplacements. Um, and this uh, specific regiment is fairly well known from uh, the defense of Stalingrad. Um, this regiment, it was, you know, 17 year old teenage girls essentially. Um, and they were able to hold off for quite a while the uh, 16th Panzer Division in 1942 in August um, as they were assaulting Stalingrad. Uh, the story is that, you know, they set their guns on the, the lowest elevation elevation placement and use them as uh, tank guns. And the story is then that as the Germans, you know, they obliterated everyone, that they were then shocked when they came upon the bodies and discovered that they were women. You know, they were just astounded. So it really um, speaks to the ferocity of some of these women and what they went through. Yeah. And of course, you know, there are a myriad of other jobs that I won't go into. They were sappers, they were mechanics, um, they worked in communications, basically any job you can think of, women were performing it. Um, and even more so in the rear, of course, um, you know, being able to uh, work and do all the paperwork and work in hospitals and all of that kind of stuff. Because of course, you know, there's this natural inclination that women are, of course, you know, mothering, that they're going to be good in the medical field because they're good at caretaking. And so there's always that kind of stereotypical idea that, oh, we're just going to put all these women in hospitals, even if you really don't know what you're doing. <laughs> hmm. And it came up earlier, but if you pop back that previous slide, if you wouldn't mind, Heidi, because yeah. um, it came up about uh, in the sidebar earlier about, about the fact that lots of Soviet photos from the war eras are staged and people who... Yeah. Have, have tried to use the fact that some of these photos, the bottom left one there looks like it's staged. The yeah. because they're staged, women didn't actually perform combat roles. There was this been that counter history thing like 20 years ago that no, no, all the photos we have of the women are staged. They weren't really near the front line. I mean, Luba talks about the fact that Pavlichenko's story probably is, is, is not true, but there are plenty of other female snipers mm -hmm. whose stories were true. But if you're going to make the argument that these people can't have existed because these are staged photos, then that would also apply to the staged photos of male participants. Because yeah. So you can't yeah. use that argument without using it across the board. And the fact is, and it came up in the sidebar again, is that lots of American photos are staged, lots of Canadian and British photos yeah. are staged. So just because some of these photos do look to be and staged is maybe not the right word, posed, stroke, staged. Yeah. But yeah and there's also press photos as well. But to try yeah. and dismiss them as not happening because they're a stage photo is just, is from, is just ridiculous. That's, it's a pretty weak defense. Yeah, it is. Um, 
Very but, much. So I'll, let, I'll let you go back to your next slide. I've just I'm enjoying I'm, no, no. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're good. No, I mean yes. Uh, most of them do look pretty staged, but even still, I still think they're fascinating. And you know, you can really see just how young they were. Yeah. Um, it, it astounds me. They look like they're some of them look like they're you know 15. Um. Anyways. Yeah. So, I know. Um. Liuba discussed to you after the war that things were pretty devastating, that, you know, this whole generation of men were gone. And these women come back from the war and there was, you know, a bit of an un a miscommunication and misunderstanding about the what these women actually did at the front. Um, you know, this quote down at the bottom just breaks my heart, um, you know, that these women, you know, call them military bitches, army whores, um, rifle sluts, you know, that really they were at the front to be prostitutes. And we know that, yes, women sleep with men. That's fine at the front. You know, if you can get some comfort from each other, that's fine. But the fact that, you know, they were only there for sex is so heartbreaking and so untrue that it just makes me so sad. <laughs> um, and, you know, we know that for a long time, these women stayed silent. They really didn't talk about it. I mean, men often didn't talk about it as well. But, you know, these celebrations, you know, victory celebrations, they really didn't take part in many of them. And it, it wasn't until later. And so you see in the 60s when these women are getting awarded these medals, you know, that they start talking about it. Um, then they are included in these victory parades. and. So there really is this lack of understanding and it didn't come until later. And unfortunately, you know, now many of them are dying and I was in awe that Liuba was able to meet so many of them because that's yeah, I, 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 I bet you were just jealous of the fact that, that you know, she oh, yeah. met these people that, you know, she, obviously she was closer to them being that she was in Moscow. Well, you're in Moscow, but you, she was in the other Moscow. Different one. Yeah, <laughs> she was able to speak to these people and I'm, I'm just I'm going to interrupt again I remember the show we did about eight months ago Brandon Schechter from Canada about the fact that within the Russian language we we are being respectful to them we're talking about women or females but the, the yet the language used at the time referred to the Red Army women as girls it was the Russian for girls women wasn't the term used and I think that or well, Brandon made the point that also contributed to the fact that they were dismissed a bit because it was girls on the front line as opposed to women. One word in, instills a little bit more kind of professionalism. Girls sounds mm -hmm. a bit like they're just running around, you know, having sex. And women, females, yeah. maybe has a bit of a, a more serious attitude. But that was the choice or the, the situation at the time is that it, girls was the word that was used. Yes, no, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because um, that 100% is the case, you know, in some of the readings and things, you know, when they call them girls, it just, you know, it boils my blood because it's like, no, no, these were women, you know, girls makes it sound like, you know, they're, you know, 13, and I'm sure some of them were, but girls just seem so disrespectful in my view. Um, and so, yes, I intentionally make sure I use female, woman, you know, just because I think it conveys so much more. Yeah. But anyways, um, so yeah, a lot of these quotes that I have throughout the show are from um, The Unwomanly Face of War by uh, Svetlana Alexievich, which was fantastic. It's one of my favorite books. Um, and, you know, it's interesting that we talk about these Russian women when meanwhile you have the allies who are just so concerned with their women and of course, within America, you know, you had the WASPs who were pilots, but, you know, they didn't go offshore. Um, and instead, we have these portrayals of women in uniform as these glamorous, you know, thin, beautiful white women. And, you know, they're there to find a husband. Um, they're there to, yes, support, but, you know, there's this whole debate, who can pull the trigger? of an anti-aircraft gun. We can't have women pull the trigger. They can do everything else, but they can't pull the trigger because what if we have women be the killers? You know, it was shrouded in so much morality 
And, you know, we see that with Pavlichenko's U.S. tour, um, you know, when the journalists are asking her questions, you know, what kind of underwear do you wear? How do you apply your makeup at the front? And it's, you know, you, you can tell she just gets so exasperated because that's not important. And the whole, you know, allied Western culture wasn't ready to see their women in these different positions, you know, instead they have to be well dressed and then even then when they were in the military you know they had to be supervised because we can't let our women run wild you know oh no they're going to be promiscuous or there was the opposite oh no they're going to all be lesbians you know like it was this whole mess of things that i just shake my head at because it's so ridiculous <laughs> Yeah. Well, it, it's always the same when we have people like Kate Vigers coming on talking about the SOE and 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 those figures. Is that the that the the recruitment officers, the training officers, said such ridiculous things about some of these people who we know on to receive George Crosses for bravery and Violet Zabo and those kind of people. You know, oh, it's amazing! Amazing, these pretty little things can do so much. And you just go, oh, fuck off! You know, you just you just the language you. But, but that's that's yeah. where we're stuck. We're stuck with the fact that the attitudes were then were the attitudes as they were then, and we can only kind of deal with it and just acknowledge the fact that it it. it it wasn't perfect, uh, far from perfect, but the contribution was nevertheless there, isn't it? That's the, that, you know, you can't, the results are if the Red Army hadn't been using women, and indeed you can extend that if there weren't women in the Canadian, British and American forces, we probably wouldn't have won the war. That We needed personnel. We needed people to do those jobs. And, and, and of course, the environment was sexist. Of course, they weren't allowed to do everything. And of course, there were lots of problems that are going on with that. But the fact is, without women taking on those jobs, that the war wouldn't have been won. We talk about which tank won the war which aircraft but it was it was everybody amassing together to 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 to, to come together to defeat that enemy but um anyway i've gone mm -hmm. off on one of my my tangents there, yeah. but um back to you sorry yeah no 100 percent. what you're saying is correct and i mean unfortunately we still see you know these same concerns brought up when you talk about modern military forces that you know women are going to disrupt unit cohesion when we know that's just not true and so it's just interesting. I love, you know, juxtapositioning the allied forces and, you know, their ideas about women versus, you know, the Red Army, who basically, they were desperate. They needed people and women came through for them. So it's just interesting because it's wrapped up in so much morality. And, you know, it just makes you think about this whole idea that, the dichotomy between the feminine and the masculine that femininity just you know in so many cultures portrays weakness masculinity equals strength and i liuba talked about this where you know you have these women who are very feminine and yet very capable as snipers as well and it's it's interesting because people think you can only be one of those when in fact you know people are complex you can be more than one thing and so you do have these women who, you know, want to stay feminine, want to do their hair, and who are also deadly killers, and those don't cancel each other out. Um, but there's also this idea that these women, you know, were dressing in male clothes. I love um, some of the accounts in the beginning before the women were issued female uniforms that, you know, they were having to stuff boots. You know, they were having to, like, pull pants up to their armpits you know, they were trying to make bras out of anything they could find. Like, you know, that they were dressing as men and they're doing these male actions. So they must want to become men. You know, maybe they're transgender. Maybe they're this or that. And it's like, no, you know, you can be more than one thing. Maybe there were transgender um, troops, but we don't know that. And because there were, that doesn't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> And, the, and, the, and the, the double standards are again: is that let's take male fighter pilots in World War Two, where they're British. If they weren't doing everything about their appearance, they were trying to put the leather jackets on and have their their crusher caps at the right angle and and brill cream in their hair and have as much insignia as they could to show off. The, so, if if they if if we're saying that all oh, these women are putting makeup on, they're trying to make themselves look attractive. Men in war were doing that as well. Men men, men were peacocks as well. So again, the double standards aspect really annoys me on this. Is that why shouldn't a woman in World War II 
try and get lipstick or try and get a, 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 her her uniform to fit better if she wants to, so she feel, feels bet, better look. Because men were doing exactly the same thing. They're, in the British Army, yeah. men have the battle battle dress and the walking out dress. And the walking out dress is where you tailor it to show off your muscles or show off your shoulders. Oh, yeah. It's it's again double standards. Yeah, and you know we we also know that you know if these women did you know try to look feminine or you know do their hair, a lot of that is just reminding them of the comforts of home. You know when you're away from your family from your home for years at a time, when you haven't seen your family in years, you know those little things can do so much for morale. You know these women are living in awful situations. They're being harassed, you know, you know, their food wasn't great all the time. It's cold. Any of these little things that can provide comfort, like who cares? Yeah. <laughs> um, anyways, the last slide is just, you know, some of these books. I didn't include Leo Bus since you had already linked them, but these are some of the ones that are my favorites that are in English for those that are interested. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the conclusion. I, d I don't know if there were other things you wanted to discuss or if you had further questions. Well, thank you very much for the, pre for the presentation. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, and it's been more conversational than than some of them are, but that's great. Um, folks, if you have any questions for Haley or for both of us, but particularly Haley, and because you know, I, I'm really glad that you're bringing up these themes of the standards and women, because it is important. And we always talk mm -hmm. about it is World War II military history is dominated by white middle-aged white guys it shouldn't be that way people like me are trying to push it and change it but it is going to be that way so a lot of our understanding of that era is through the lens and the voices of white middle-aged white guys mm -hmm. and, and there's nothing wrong with that and lots of white middle-aged white guys are fantastic historians but it's about opening out the our, our, our ideas mm -hmm. and understanding of this so my first question before we have to deal with some of the viewers is is what what's going to be next in terms of bringing people like yourself tackling world war ii where i said earlier in the sidebar understanding lgbtq rights and things is, is just un, it's, it's normal for people of your age and and, and where, where do you think our study of world war ii will become fairer do you think we will have more voices i mean it should be but will, will it happen will, will you will you be able to beat down the door of, of, the, of the, the male gatekeeping i mean i sure hope so i you know we've got this very distinct generational understanding and i do think that as more people study world war ii i think there's no shortage in interest of the war it's I mean, I love it, it's fantastic. I mean, as horrible as it was, it just, it stuck with me so much that, you know, I think people are looking for more of these perspectives to tell, more things to really examine because it's been, you know, some of, some of the topics have just been beat to death. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's time to uh, get some fresh ideas, I think. And, and, you know, just really pushing back against some of these statements that have been made. I mean, you know, one of the historians, I mean, I love Faces Battle, I love John Keegan, but he wrote in one of his books that women have never at any time been in combat. And that's just not true. We know that since it's there has been Israel. War, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Since there's been war, there's been women in combat. I here in the States, you know, there are some stories of women in the American Civil War where, you know, they're there as a couple with their husband dressed as a man. And then the whole unit is just surprised when all of a sudden she popped out a baby and nobody knew. Mm. And it just, I mean, it's, it's insane. And it gets language because there's combat and there's fighting. Because again, yeah. if, we, if we're restricting it to actual combat, so wielding yeah. a weapon or driving a tank, obviously the figures drop slightly. But if we're talking about fighting for the war effort, because you, you could be in, in, the, in the ATS in Britain on a plotting table and you're still fighting the war. It's just you're not yeah. actually doing it with a weapon. But the plotting table you're yeah. using or is still is you're still part of the active fighting of the war. It's just that you're not actually in combat. So it's about language, but we do have a few questions for you. So um, the first one is for Madcat three five two. Did Stalin have an opinion on women in the Russian military? Um, so from what we know, mostly is when Marina Raskova was trying to get the air units, these female, you know, that really Stalin was opposed to that for a while, and it was one of those things that as 
the war went on and, you know, things were looking a little dire that he relented. Um, I mean, I think it's one of those things you do it because you need to, not because you want to. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it, when it comes to Stalin, understanding what he was really thinking, like yeah. with Hitler, that they, they, they did they say one thing one minute and say something the next minute? Um, there was another question I was going to do. Um, do you have a particular woman whose story touched you the most or was the most interesting? Um, I really love Rosa Shanina's, Shanina's uh, story that Leoba touched on. She's yeah, one yeah. of the special ones that I love. Um, I mean, there's just so many amazing ones. And... So it's hard to choose, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, no, it's. I, I agree. There, there are there are more than one um, mm -hmm. people to to look up to from that um, uh, era. Um, we kind of touched on this, but um, uh, we had the question: How were Soviet military women treated, memorialized after war, when compared to their male counterparts? Now, you said it yourself, and Luba said it uh, a couple of days ago. Nineteen sixty-five, the twentieth anniversary end of the end of the Great Patrick War was was key because that's when Brezhnev takes over in sixty-four after Khrushchev, mm -hmm. and Khrushchev, of course, had been there in World War II. Well, Brezhnev had lived there as well, but Khrushchev was there in Stalingrad, as played by Bob Hoskins at Enemy of the Gates and what have you. And, and it's interesting that it was Brezhnev's era that seemed to see a, a more of a recognition of women and people from other uh, uh, races that were within the Red mm -hmm. Army. Um, so that was 65 was a, kind of a milestone. But in your, I'll, I'll wait for your answer to that question. There, there yeah. obviously were phases, but but, but yeah. Um, yeah, to handle the question, how how <laughs> were women memorialized and treated? Yeah, definitely. Uh, in those 60s eras and on, we see them included in the military parades. We see memorials, um, especially certain women that were from distinct areas. So I know the two uh, women from Kazakhstan, um, Mamatova, and then there was a sniper as well. You know, they got their face on stamps. There were memorials in Kazakhstan. Um, so a lot of those local memorials from, you know, memorializing where somebody was from, uh, there were quite a few that, you know, received this acclaim and there are, you know, streets named after them or I've, I've tried to find more of a general like national memorial to these women. And that I think is um, slim pickings. There's more work I think needs to be done on the national level, but you find more of these local memorials. Um, yeah. No, and, and as as we're going to be talking about, hopefully, when I get this panel discussion, the historiography of the Eastern Front is is, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Western Front is complicated. With the Eastern Front, it's even more complicated, and it's we've entered a new era now because of the the events of last year with Ukraine and whatever. So we're now got a new situation of understanding the Eastern Front. So, so how they were perceived in 1945, returning from war, how they different to how it was 10 years later, 20 years later, and so on and so forth, and then the, the proliferation of books and things, and now we have this positive both negative aspect of as we said with the sniper show the video games that the, the, mm -hmm. that are kind of uh getting the stories out there but not necessarily in the way that is best in the best interests of understanding the nuance of history but you know so but the other question we had i've got to go back and find it for you is is what is next for you personally i'm trying to find the question that was from ian i think asked it but someone but uh, anyway what was what's what's next for you Haley, in terms of your own projects Oh, there we are. Um, so what do you uh, to do next? In terms of Russian women, I'm still uh, posting about them on social media. I mean, I have an Instagram and a Facebook account where I post their stories and pictures. I do a monthly newsletter on Substack about saying these stories because, you know, I studied them uh, in school. And since then, you know, I've gone on and had another job. So unfortunately, I'm not, you know, engaged with them as much as I want to be. Um, and so just just for me to keep them alive and in my forefront, I do these, you know, small little internet things. Um, but in terms of my job here, um, like I said, our big thing coming up is our queer history project. We're looking to do some oral histories and, uh, you know, active collection campaign, we're doing some public programming. Um, I'm really excited. Uh, so unfortunately, Idaho has this history of 
white supremacy and hate groups uh, that is not great. And mm -hmm. so we're doing a public program on kind of a history of hate groups in Idaho, kind of looking at why it kind of became this haven for, you know, the Aryan nations and others. And unfortunately, I don't know how much um, outside of this area people know, but last year in Coeur d'Alene, which is in northern Idaho, um, there was a group of about 30 men who were arrested from a group called the Patriot Front, which is just another hate group, white supremacist group, where they were basically gonna go riot at a pride festival. And so really it's been kind of at the forefront of our area because of course you had Richard Butler and the Aryan Nations and then those were taken down. But since then you've got all of these other subsects popping up and it's, you know, maybe it's not out for racism anymore. Maybe it's, you know, this violence against um, the queer community. So we're really trying to, uh, do some work on that front. And then, you know, just the, the usual business of running a nonprofit. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and, and you touched on some great ideas and the fact that the bit, the best work of a public historian is not just talking about the past, but using the past to illustrate uh, and explain the present and where do these demographics come from and, and, and the far right element is, is, is a problem throughout Europe. It's a problem in France, mm -hmm. it's in the UK and, and, and it needs people like yourself who are reminding people because because history gets used by people who don't know what they're talking about, and it needs the proper historians to come in and say, "Yes, you're you're getting this wrong." Like the, for it, I I get very defensive when people start saying, "Well, the Nazis were socialists." Yeah, just because it has the word socialist in the title in the name doesn't mean it's socialist. Like you're you're using it using it incorrectly. <laughs> you know, they were a fascist far right um, organization. The word socialist. Anyway, so I'm going down another rabbit hole. So <laughs> But that's what the work you're doing is really important. And I, it's good Thank to be you. reminded by people like yourself that, they're, that for all the wonderful historians I have coming on, for whom it's an industry, it's producing a new book every year about a new battle. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's that kind of fun element of, of dissecting other battlefields is that history is front lines for you. It's about changing mm -hmm. people's attitudes where you live. And, and that's why people like yourself are very important. So I, I thank you on behalf of World War II for doing the work because bringing up the subject of homosexuality and places like Idaho and far right groups, I'm sure you deal with lots of hassle. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of pushback, especially, I mean, here in town, we've got a fairly conservative religious group. And, and so, you know, people aren't always happy with what we do, but I just, I think it's so important. So thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that vote of confidence. <laughs> well, thank you. So I'm going to just take you off the screen for a second to tell what we've got coming up tomorrow. I'll bring you back in a second. So, folks, we have another show tomorrow coming your way. We are talking about the Waffen SS units at the Battle of Kharkov in 1943. Then Saturday, Mark Urban is coming on to talk about his new book about the Red Devils. And then there's lots more stuff coming your way. And I will reschedule those other Eastern Front shows in due course. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to click subscribe, the little bell, so you see the notifications. People have asked about the links to various projects Haley's involved with they're all in the description below the historical society uh instagram twitter all there so you can make contact and find out that but i'm gonna bring Haley back in to say basically thank you very much you broke your dark you did your first world war ii tv uh appearance i'd be happy to have you back and talk about something else um especially something nice and woke because if i don't get a kind of a comment about being woke i don't feel i'm doing it right enough i i, I said in the in the side but i bet i'll get comments saying this about oh it was interesting history but you're being all woke again there woody well i don't care i like being woke i'm woke and proud of it it's, so, it's a badge of honor <laughs> it is a badge of honor i will get a sweat sweatshirt made of it. so anyway it's been brilliant having you on thank you very much for joining us and thanks for joining us and all your questions people i will see you all tomorrow cheers everybody this is World War II TV signing off. Bye. Bye.